We're here at Freedom Fest 2022. It's the last day. We're delighted to just nab Brad Palumbo from the Foundation for Economic Education. Brad is a policy writer and really, really great guy to follow on social media if you can uh, find him. Where, where are you biggest on? Twitter, I think. Twitter. Okay, great. You can follow Brad on Twitter. You'll learn a lot. Brad, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to speak with us. I want to ask you, looking back over the past two years, what do you think are, number one, the, the, the worst economic misconceptions you've seen and perhaps the worst policy mistakes that have come from those misconceptions? Yeah, I think we're living through a time where people are having the necessity to learn Economics 101 forced upon them by the fact that inflation is hitting every American, you know, the average household, something like $5,000 it'll cost them uh, over the past year just to maintain their same standard of living. So a lot of people are encountering words like inflation for the first time in their lifetimes, right? Unless they're older and lived through the 80s. I mean, someone like me uh, in my 20s, I've never seen inflation like this before. So people are being forced to realize um, what is inflation? What is the Federal Reserve? What does government spending have to do with any of it? And I guess the biggest misconception I've seen is the attempt by a lot of progressives or Democrats or even just everyday people who aren't super familiar with how this stuff works to pin inflation on corporate greed. Or the idea that corporations are just raising prices to rip people off right now. To be clear, corporations are greedy, but they're greedy all the time, right? They're profit-seeking. And so the idea that that would be responsible for our current inflation, it doesn't make much sense. Because we, they were just as profit-seeking five years ago when we didn't have inflation. And then we have inflation in some areas more than others. Gas and housing and food are extra expensive, while other stuff's not gone up by that much. But it's not as if companies in one sector are run by greedier people than in the others. So a shockingly high percentage of the public thinks that corporate greed is part of the reason we have inflation when an overwhelming supermajority of economists that are surveyed would say that's not the case. Uh, why is it then that some companies are in fact making record profits during the inflation? Well, it's funny because you look at profit numbers and uh, you see billions and billions, but when you put it in a percentage, it might just be three or five percent. Um, so something like Kroger, for example, a big grocery chain, has been demonized by Elizabeth Warren for running a uh, progressive senator, for running these massive profits. And then it's because it's in the billions. Then you look, it's like two percent profit margin. Um, and so I think the, the extent to which companies are getting away with big profit margins is one being exaggerated, but two, it's not really actually, uh, to the extent it is happening, a free market phenomenon. These companies, it's ironic, but the federal government tried to do trillions of dollars worth of stimulus. So much of it ended up actually going to crony capitalist subsidies. The, for example, the Paycheck Protection Program that they poured hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars into. We were told that this stimulus program passed by Republicans and Democrats would help save small businesses and help them keep their employees. We now know, looking back, that it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per every job it saved and most of the money went to big corporations that didn't need it. It was kind of a corrupt thing. It ended up being a real scam. So a lot of these companies have been basically flushed with funding from the government. And so why are they seeing big profits? That's a big part of why. And it's ironic because it came from the same stimulus bills that were supposed to help everyday people. Do you think the media has done a good enough job to explain the real causes of inflation in, in your books? I think no, because one of the biggest causes of inflation is the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, and its decision to essentially create trillions of new dollars out of thin air. The Fed chair, Jerome Powell, literally laughed this in an interview. He said, yeah, we just created money to stimulate the economy. We just printed it up digitally. Uh, but when you flood the zone with trillions of new dollars, obviously the dollars currently in existence will become less valuable as a result. And that's one of the biggest things. But you never hear about that in the media very much. Most people don't even know what the Federal Reserve is. So I think they've underlooked and undercovered one of the biggest things. I mean, Milton Friedman said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Now, I think there's other things that go into high prices, but the underlying cause of inflation has a lot to do with the Federal Reserve, but you barely see that in any of the media coverage. Are you expecting a recession? Yes. 
Yes. I mean, so the technical definition of a recession, as I'm sure you know, is only just two quarters of negative growth. And we already saw the last quarter is, is negative growth. And this quarter is expected to also be, so then we would technically be in a recession. And I'd be shocked if the quarter two numbers for 2022 weren't in the red. Um, so I think, yeah, we will be in a recession. And the real question is whether we'll just be a little blip, a small recession, or whether it will be another recession like we saw in 2008. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it really depends on whether policymakers will learn the lessons of what they did wrong. And I don't see a whole lot of self-reflection going on. I see a lot of scapegoating. I think the, the reports and concerns about a recession, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they came on quite suddenly. What do you think has primarily caused this recession or potential recession? Oh, well, you know, it's hard to ever pin it on one thing. Recessions do just happen. They're part of the business cycle, right? The economy goes up and it eventually has to go down. One thing that caused it is hard to pin. But I think that we are essentially seeing, especially inflation is the biggest thing uh, that's really hurting the economy right now. And that was ultimately driven by the Federal Reserve's creation of trillions of new dollars and Congress's decision to just spend trillions of dollars that we don't have in budget deficits. Uh, and when you do that, at the same time that many parts of the economy were locked down or restricted, you restrict supply, but you funnel all this money into stimulating demand prices go up. That's pretty basic economics 101. And so I think that created the inflation problem, which has then led to, you know, a ripple effect throughout the economy and a lot of our current woes. Then there's things like the housing market, the stock market, crypto crash, all these things are involved. But it's it ultimately comes down to the technical definition of a recession is just economic growth. And I don't I don't see any way we avoid having negative growth this quarter and then officially being in a recession. Do you think that given the current administration's, I'm going to call them anti-energy policies, right? It may be not fair, it's not objective, but anti-fossil fuel policies and this transition to green, will this slow down the recovery from a recession? Well, the gas prices are killing people right now. $5 gas. I went to an event where we actually lowered the gas price to $2.38. This was at Americans for Prosperity. And there were lines for hours of people who came to get the gas. That was the price that, that gas was when President Biden first took office, $2.38. Now it's over $5, $4.50, depending where you go, $6, $7 in some urban areas. That is impossible for people to deal with. That bankrupts a working or lower middle class family. Um, and it has ripple effects throughout the entire economy. The price of diesel, for example, affects the price of everything because so many things are transported. Uh, so I think it's a big role. And I, I, to be fair to the president, it's certainly not all his policies. There's a lot that goes into gas prices. I mean, the war in Ukraine obviously has disrupted the global supply of oil, which leads to higher prices. But they were rising before that. They rose almost, the gas prices rose almost a full dollar under Biden's watch before the invasion happened. So they use that to completely deflect blame. It is a factor, but ultimately, yes, they've done a lot to discourage domestic energy production. Whether it's canceling pipelines, whether it's blocking leases for oil and gas refineries, all of this, one, it's, it, re, it reduces supply in the short term and in the future, which means higher prices, but it also sends a signal that discourages investment. If the, if the government is getting in the way of your industry, you're not, you're, and, and you think that they're even just gonna do more? Because Joe Biden said on the campaign trail that his goal was ultimately to end fossil fuels. That discourages investment. New companies supplying and entering the market, of course, that will lead to higher prices over time. So I think he is being blamed for this. I think he deserves some blame. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, but I think he does because he has had, as you say, some anti-energy policies at a time where we need energy independence. We need to be increasing American energy because, look, you can care about climate change. You can think that it's a serious issue. But it's not going to make any meaningful difference. These few policies here or there, they'll make gas more expensive. But ultimately, other countries are doing the vast majority of the carbon emissions, and they show no sign of slowing down. So even if you're very concerned about that, I mean, the U.S. could stop all carbon emissions tomorrow, and it would barely make a dent in the predictions for what it will affect with climate change. But gas prices, you know, really are hurting Americans in much more tangible ways. So I think the administration, they have their priorities out of whack. Let's look a little bit further afield than in America, like you brought up other countries we see in China. They're, they're looking at bank runs at the moment. A lot of people in China unhappy. We look at the British pound, the Japanese yen, 
and the, the euro falling in value significantly. Um, are you expecting a, a potential global crisis? I think the recession will be global. I hope it doesn't become a full-blown crisis, but I think we're heading into a global recession for sure. Um, and economies are so interlinked now. And in some ways, that's a good thing, but in some ways, it's a bad thing. And the downside of that can be that, well, you know, what happens in the U.S., what happens in China, it, hap it affects what happens in Europe. So it is all kind of globalized in that sense. And there's greatness that comes out of that in terms of trade and exchange and growth. But the downside also means that it's pretty hard for you if, if things are going a, um, if they're going astray abroad, it's hard to avoid that coming home. So I think it will all probably enter a global recession. Finally, tell me a little bit about the importance or the, the, the kind of problem with the levels of debt globally, because we hear some people saying debt doesn't matter, deficits don't matter. Can you explain whether they do or don't? Well, deficits do matter. Um, it is complicated, but uh, fundamentally, the government cannot create resources. Any money that it spends ultimately has to come from the people, either directly through higher taxes or indirectly by running up debt or printing new money that will either inflate away our savings or burden us over the long run. So the national debt has a few big impacts for everyday people. But one is that we have to pay the interest on it. And pretty soon with interest rates going up, we're going to have to fork over trillions of dollars every year just to cover the interest on the national debt. And that will mean new taxes on everyday Americans. And that's one consequence. It also, you know, drags down the economy, slows growth, reduces average household income. Um, nobody within economics, some fringe people with the modern monetary theory think that the government is Santa Claus and give up. And pretty much most economists acknowledge there are downsides of debt. Uh, the only question is how much and how fast are we going to reach those? Because, you know, if you just have a little bit of debt, you only have a little bit of problem. But now we're at the point where we're heading towards uh, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, going becoming insolvent, and they can't pay the obligations they have. And when we do that, when we hit that point, that's when Americans will realize what a dangerous game we've been playing. You know, unfortunately, Americans, like most people, aren't really able to uh, deal with a problem or grapple with it until it's too late. You can warn them, you can warn them, but until a pandemic actually happens, now they'll take pandemics seriously in the future. And when the debt really blows up in our face with interest rates going up and trillions forked over for new taxes every year, that's when people are going to start taking it seriously. And it'll be a little bit too little too late, but that's just the way that human nature works. 